Uh, hello, my name is Aiden Chung, and this is my presentation on a review of brain stimulation as an alternative method of treating OCD. And the reason why I chose this topic for my research paper that I wrote is because I personally have OCD. So I wanted to use this as a way to kind of learn more about my condition and myself. And I hope that I can teach other people about this as well. So the outline of my presentation, the first part is the introduction. So I'm going to go over like what is OCD, what is brain stimulation, and why is it even being used to treat OCD? And then for the breakdown, I'm going to go over the main types of stimulation techniques being used for OCD and whether or not they are effective. And then I'm going to go over um, what are some actions that the scientific community can take to further our understanding of the study. So OCD is an abbreviation for obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's a neurological disorder that um, leads people to, as the name suggests, repeatedly experiencing obsessions, which are unwanted intrusive thoughts and compulsions, which are, un which are uncontrollable repetitive behaviors. Uh, someone is classified as having OCD if it disrupts their daily lives and routines, and is not as uncommon as people may think, with it affecting around 2.5 million people inside the United States. Uh, brain stimulation is the range of techniques used to modulate brain activity. It specifically um, activates or inhibits specific brain regions with electricity via electrodes, which are conductors that allow electrical currents to enter or leave a medium, and magnetic fields, which are magnetic, magnetic pulses from a coil placed on a scalp that create small electrical currents in the brain. And these brain stimulations are either invasive or non-invasive. It's just basically whether or not they're surgically, the devices are surgically implanted in your brain. And they're often used to treat various neurological and psychiatric disorders such as Parkinson's. Okay, for OCD, the most common current therapeutics are psychotherapies. An example of psychotherapy is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's, basic, it's basically a structured conversation between a patient and a therapist. And then we also have serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SRIs, and they basically increase serotonin levels in the brain. Uh, however, some patients are unresponsive to both types of treatments, uh, meaning that they have refractory OCD. So brain stimulation is being used to, as a exploration to treat OCD for patients that have refractory OCD. Okay, so all of these brain stimulation methods target and modify some region of the CSTC, which is a broad network of brain regions that control habit formation, reward, and the execution of movement. It's uh, found to be hyperactive in patients with OCD. Specifically, it disrupts the balance between the brain's habit learning system and uh, the brain's goal-directed system with more emphasis towards the former. So a uh, habit learning system is basically a part of the brain involved in forming habits and routines through repeated actions and reinforcement, while goal-directed systems is basically a cognitive process in the brain that involves planning and executing actions based on their uh, expected outcomes. However, because there's more emphasis towards the habit learning system, a person with OCD increasingly responds to everyday situations in life more rigidly and repeatedly expressed to obsessions and compulsions. All of these different techniques differ in how they exactly go about modifying the CSTC. And a, a little note there is that each method has multiple variations. So these variations try to improve on the original model by either making it more effective or um, kind of designing it in a way that leads to additional uh, benefits in patients. Okay, so the first type of brain stimulation method is transcranial magnetic stimulation, aka TMS, and it's a non-invasive uh, therapeutic, meaning that the electro electromagnetic coil is placed against the patient's scalp, and it's kind of directed towards a specific region in the CSTC, and it delivers magnetic pulses to that area and stimulates the nerve cells. It's generally found to be effective in lowering symptoms of OCD in comparison to the sham treatment, meaning that it does have actual effects. Uh, in terms of like specifics towards variations, high-frequency TMS was found more effective than low-frequency TMS. So high-frequency TMS produces more excitatory effects in the brain, while low frequency, lower frequency TMS produces inhibitory effects, and there are no adverse side effects.
Uh, theta burst stimulation is a type of TMS. It sends uh, bursts of brief recurring magnetic pulses at higher frequencies, and is also found to be generally effective in lowering symptoms of OCD. In terms of the specifics, uh, continuous TBS uh, lowered anxiety and depression, but did not differ too much from the placebo treatment. Uh, continuous TBS is basically a lo low, low frequency version of TBS that produces inhibitory effects in the brain. And then accelerated high dose DPS, oh, TBS produced similar results to actual TMS. Uh, so accelerated high dose TBS is essentially kind of like a more concentrated uh, version of TBS that's supposed to make the treatment plan shorter because one drawback from all of these treatments is that the process of getting treatment could last up to like many months. And then there are no adverse side effects for this one. Deep brain stimulation is the only uh, method out of all the ones I mentioned that is invasive. So the electrodes are, sur are surgically planted onto a specific region of the CSTC and that those electrodes are connected to a generator that generates electrical pulses. Uh, it's found also to be effective in lowering OCD symptoms. Uh, specifically, cyclic DBS has external benefits, but can lead to relapses in comparison to continuous DBS. So cyclic DBS is kind of like the experimental version of this treatment, and it's basically a kind where uh, the electrical pulse generator is programmed to deliver stimulation in cycles, uh, while continuous DBS is the more default version where it's kind of um, given in a continuous stream of stimulation, and it can lead to adverse side effects such as hypomania. Uh, the last type is, I'm going to talk about is transcranial direct current stimulation. It is non-invasive. So the like the uh, first two treatments, the electrodes are planted on a patient's scalp is external, and uh, it delivers weak direct electrical currents to a part of the CSTC. It was found to be overall effective for treating OCD. And then once again, the specifics, the high frequency uh, T TDCS led to better results, basically just uh, high, higher frequencies that the electrical currents are delivered. And then bipolar TDCS was found to be just as effective as polar dependent TDCS. So essentially for this kind of treatment, there are two um, electrodes placed on your body. For polar dependent, there's one placed on the scalp and one placed on the shoulder. So you have your active, uh, you have your active and your reference electrode. The active uh, electrode is the one that's responsible for being the medium that actually delivers the electrical current to the brain tissue. While the reference electrode kind of serves as kind of this mediator that uh, regulates the cycle between the electrodes and the uh, electrical generator. Bipolar TDCS uh, is instead of having one reference and one active electrode, both of those electrodes are active. And for this one, there are no adverse side effects. Okay, so the conclusion of this is that brain stimulation, like the portrait, like the whole thing you're supposed to get out of this is that brain stimulation as a whole is a valid, safe, and effective method for treating OCD. And it can therefore be used as this automatic third option for patients with refractory OCD. And they all mainly work due to how they uh, modified a specific part of the CSTC. However, it's still not agreed upon which specific brain region or type of brain stimulation technique is most effective, which leads to the next potential steps. So I believe that um, there should be more research slash testing of all methods, specifically further exploration of variations, both that were found to be ineffective and ones that lead to more additional benefits. So for example, uh, for ineffective, like how uh, cyclic DBS led to relapses in OCD patients, and an example for additional benefits is how continuous data burst stimulation relieves symptoms of anxiety and depression in OCD patients. And then we also need more comparative studies. So for the first two points I made, uh, as you can tell from this, the previous slides, there's just so many different types of brain stimulation methods. And within those, I only covered like the four main ones. And then within those four main types, there's many subtypes. And I couldn't even really explain or go into depth about any of them because of timing reasons. But it's, and there's on top of that, there's also many different parts of the CSTC that these uh, studies target that I wasn't even able to talk about, such as uh, the sublimary motor area or the SMA and the uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex or DLPFC. And so it's really highly contested, like what exactly is the best 
uh, way to go about this because there's just too many different types. And typically for these studies, they focus on like one type of brain stimulation method and like maybe one or two regions that they target. There's not many studies that compare both of them. So if we bring more comparative studies into the literature, it allows us to figure out exactly the, um, the points that make one method more effective than the other, the, the aspects of the methods that lead to additional benefits or that makes it ineffective so that we can, we can condense that information together and form a all-encompassing, more effective treatment. And then uh, long-term studies. So this field is, we also need long-term studies, that's what I would say. This field is relatively new. The research for brain stimulation has only really begun like 20 years ago, like the early 2000s. So we are not quite sure what brain stimulation exactly does to us very long term. Uh, it's effect, it's found to be effective short term, but we don't know like down the line, let's say in like another 20, 30 years, if it leads to relapses in OCD patients, or if it can lead to adverse side effects, we don't know. So if we have those long term studies, then it kind of allows us to see is brain stimulation, um, is brain stimulation worth it down the line? And um, that's kind of it for me. Uh, before I go to, uh, we go to the questions, I would like to thank my mentor, Tiffany, Tiffany Chen, who helped me uh, write this paper and walk me through creating the slideshow. And that's it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Aiden. And thank you so much for sharing that. This is something that you, you know, um, are struggling with yourself and that this is such a personally meaningful um, and impactful project for you. Um, we had a question from Neha. So it's not entirely related to the science, but um, Neha was still curious. How does the public's misunderstanding of OCD, often trivializing it as being just neat or organized, um, contribute to the stigma around the disorder? And also what steps, um, in your view, can be taken to increase awareness of the true nature of, of, of this disorder? Oh, that's a really interesting question. And I am very passionate about this because I feel that recently, this goes, this applies to many different um, like neurological disorders and mental health disorders. People kind of play it lightly in a way. So I heard many people say, oh, my OCD is shining through, even though they're just like, they're just organizing their desk and it's barely highly mischaracterized. And I do agree with that. And it's people, a lot of people don't realize how it really negatively impacts people's lives. And I think in order to kind of bring this to light, to kind of fix this issue, I think we need to spread more awareness of what actually OCD is, because I feel like there's, for many um, other neurological disorders too, there isn't much awareness of what it actually does to people and how people's daily lives look like with it, because yeah, it's not, not many people that I know of talk about it. So if you kind of open that up and maybe have more opportunities for people with OCD to kind of share what their daily lives look like and how it's not just being organized. How is it, for me, like I have to close the door five times. It may sound ridiculous, but that's just the reality of our lives. And if we just make that more aware and just rather than just generalizing it, normalizing kind of like looking more deeply into it and looking more into how it truly impacts people, then that should definitely help solve the issue. That's very incredible. And I'm also curious, so since doing this research on the different kinds of therapies, how has that and has it changed your relationship with OCD at all? Mm, okay. I think after doing this research was interesting. I think, mm, mm, I think for me, it definitely made me realize how much we don't know about OCD. I, before doing this research, I thought that science has got the OCD down, that we know everything behind it. But it turns out after doing all this, we know practically nothing, little to nothing about OCD. And so this kind of like inspires me to kind of go into this field more because before doing this research, I'm not, I wasn't really quite sure about what in medicine I was interested in. But after doing this, I realized because there's not much known about this field, not much known about people like me, I think just it makes me want to dive in deeper and really help expand knowledge on this field because it is shocking. It was a little shocking to me when I realized like how much we don't know, how much we still don't know, despite all these advances. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Aiden, for the, this amazing presentation.